It depends on, on obviously on the sins that one committed during his life, and, and also uh, you know, the judgment is also based on, on uh, how much we've been given, on how many graces we've been given. So if we make poor use of the graces we receive, then, then we deserve to be punished more harshly. Like that's the, I think it was last Sunday's gospel that said this. Uh, no, and then you know, besides these people who are there uh, for, for decades, you know, there's the, the case of poor Amelia Fatima, who uh, in the, the first apparition, the, uh, the sister uh, Lucia was asking about uh, various people she knew who died. You know, did this person go to heaven? Did, this, did that person go to heaven? Uh, where are they? And, and Amelia, is, uh, Our Lady said, would be in purgatory until the end of the world. Uh, so we probably, we all need to do more penance. Um, and St. Saint, uh, Catherine of, of Genoa uh, has left us a, a treatise on, on purgatory. Uh, she was a mystic who died in, in 1510, and she had uh, revelations about purgatory, which were a little different from, the, from what people were, were used to hearing about purgatory. It's what we, people had been saying about purgatory before that was it was sort of, like a, a hell that doesn't last forever. Um, no, so the fire was the same, uh, but the, the people there were, were very uh, unhappy and didn't want to be there. Uh, so you know, she pointed out, you know, her, her revelations uh, point out that, these, that there's, there's uh, also a, a very great difference between, between purgatory and hell, which is that the people in purgatory uh, have hope, and they know that they're saved, and they're and it's just a matter of time until they're, they're purified of all their sins and can go to heaven. So the, the pains of purgatory are, are certainly very, very intense pain, uh, no worse than, than, uh, than anything here, because you know, here, uh, we can, can, here we can still merit. Uh, no, we, this is a, a time for, for meriting, and so uh, to the, the things that we, we suffer, we can add the value of merit, and, and therefore, uh, uh, I guess, therefore, expiate much more with the with the same sufferings. In, in purgatory, there there isn't any merit. They, they've had their their chance to merit. They've had their life, and and it's over. And so, the only thing they can offer for their their sins is, is pure suffering. Uh, and so, that's why their suffering has to be much greater there than it would be, would have been here if they'd simply done enough penance. Um, <laughs> And so St. Catherine explains, all the pains of purgatory arise from original or actual sin. God created the soul pure, simple, and clean of all sin of sin, with a certain uh, beatific instinct toward himself. When sin, when the soul finds it in itself, draws it away, draws it away from God. So therefore, when a soul has come uh, near the, the pure and clear state in which it was created, this, its beatific instinct discovers itself and grows unceasingly. And so impetuously and with such uh, fierce charity, drawing it to its, to its last end, which is God, that any hindrance to its soul seems a thing past bearing. And so the more it, uh, the more it sees, the more extreme is its pain. Um, which is no, another difference between, uh, between hell and purgatory, uh, because there is no, no charity in, in hell. So at the, at the same time, however, they, they experience joy and peace because they love God and they're, they're absolutely certain that they're going to be united to him forever. So St. Catherine gives us this uh, a, a longish uh, sort of explanation about uh, what it is that, that has to be purified in, uh, in purgatory using a sort of an analogy or, or metaphor. So she says, there's no peace to be compared with that of the souls in purgatory, save that of the souls in paradise. And this peace is ever augmented by the inflowing of God into these souls, which increases in proportion, to the, is in proportion as the impediments to it are, are removed. So the more they're purified, the more, uh, the, the more God flows into them. And uh, the, the rust of sin is, is the impediment. And this is the, this fire 
And this the fire continually consumes, so that the soul in this state is continually opening itself to admit the divine communication. Right? So, you know, imagine sort of a, a, a sphere or you know, a piece of metal. You know, if the metal is, is highly, highly polished and is, is pure and clean, then it reflects the sun uh, in, and uh, shines brilliantly under the sun. But if it's rusty, then, then it doesn't reflect the sun anymore. And so this is, so the, the, the consequences of sin are, are like this. They're sort of like a, a rust that doesn't allow the, the soul to, to reflect God, doesn't allow the soul to be, be enlightened by God and, and uh, glow with, with divine glory. So as a, a covered surface can never reflect the sun, and not because there's any, any defect in that, in that orb, in that, that bowl of metal, but simply from the resistance offered by the, what covers it. So then if the covering is gradually removed, then the surface will little by little be exposed to the sun and, and more and more reflect its light. And so it is, she says, with the, the rust of sin, which is covering the soul. In purgatory, the flames unceasingly consume it. And as it disappears, unceasingly consume the rust. And as the rust disappears, the soul reflects more and more perfectly the true sun, who is God. Its contentment increases as the rust wears away and the soul is laid bare to the divine ray. And thus the one increases and the other decreases until its time in purgatory is, is accomplished. The pain never diminishes, although the time does, but the, the will is un so united to God by pure charity and so satisfied to be under his divine appointment that these souls can never say that their pains are, are pains, although when they come to to ask help for, from us, they, they do tend to say that their pains are pains, but they, no, they, they're not exactly pains like the pains in, in hell. But on, on the other hand, it's true that they suffer torments which no tongue can describe nor any intelligence comprehend unless it be revealed by a special grace. And, and she had that, that special grace of experiencing the pains of purgatory uh, on earth. And so nevertheless, no, purgatory is a, is a mercy of God. Because when the, when the soul leaves the body, and, uh, the book of Revelation tells us that nothing impure can enter heaven. So when the soul leaves the body and, and, finds, itself, no, and finds itself impure, then it can't, uh, enter, can't enter heaven. And so seeing in itself the, the impediment, which can be taken away only by means of purgatory, it casts itself therein swiftly and willingly. No, but you know, if God hadn't, uh, hadn't created purgatory, uh, then there would be no way for the soul to, to purify itself, and therefore it would be forever separated from God. But unlike the souls that are in hell, it has charity, which is drawing it towards God. And so if there was no purgatory, uh, St. Catherine says, it would suffer a hell worse than hell, uh, because the, the principal, the greatest suffering in hell is the eternal separation from God. But that eternal separation is, is all the more painful if you're, you, you love God and are drawn toward him. And so you know, purgatory is, is a mercy of God. It's a way of, of uh, letting, us, yeah, letting us be purified and, and therefore enter into, into heaven. No, but obviously no, we don't want to go to purgatory. So the, 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 uh, the, the fundamental thing we have to do is, is penance, but no, uh, penance for all of our sins could be a little hard. So when I was, uh, when I was stationed in the, in the U.S., there was a woman there who wanted to get a, a get-out-of-jail-free card like they have in Monopoly. Um, <laughs> so this was her way of talking about, uh, about plenary, plenary indulgences. So she wanted to, to, to know, you know what exactly it was she had to do to get, uh, to get a plenary indulgence. She wanted to get it right so that she got her get-out-of-jail-free card and, and, and didn't have to spend time suffering in purgatory. Um, no, and so what's an indulgence? So in, in, in the church, where the, the church is the, the communion of saints. We all help each other out in various ways. So the living uh, pray for the dead. They, they can have masses offered for them because the holy sins, oh, the holy souls can't uh, merit anymore. So the the only way that they so they can't shorten their own purgatory, but we can help them by shortening purgatory for them because we can merit and we can offer the merits of Christ in the mass. 
Um, and those who have another way of, of helping in the, in the communion of saints is that those who have the, the necessary authority in the church to establish an indulgence can help by, by establishing indulgences. So this is the, the definition of an indulgence. An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church which, as minister of the redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfactions of Christ and the saints. So Christ uh, did penance in his life, but he didn't have any sins. Our Lady did penance in her life. She didn't have any sins either. She was doing, both of them were doing penance for, for our sins, uh, for the sins of other people. Also the, the saints, you know, the saints uh, who reached the, at least the, the saints who reached the, the peak of the, of the spiritual life, uh, were entirely uh, purified from everything that was left over from their sins, but they didn't stop doing penance because, like Christ, they wanted to help also others. And so the, all of their, their merits create a sort of treasury, a treasury which is, is inexhaustible because there are the merits of, of Christ and, and Our Lady in there, uh, not, not to mention all, all the other saints, and those, those merits are, are far greater than than the, uh, the temporal punishment for, for all the sins of everyone in the world, or for all the sins of everyone who will ever live. Uh, and so, you know, the church is the, the minister of redemption, and so can uh, ask God to, to apply these, these merits uh, to, to people in order to, to, to cancel part of the, that temporal punishment. So there, there's a, a slight difference between the way this works for, for people who are living and the way it works for those who are dead. So the, the church militant, the church on the earth, has authority o over those of us who are still alive. Uh, and so in our case, it, in the, the church can, can authoritatively ask uh, for these merits to be applied to, to us. Uh, for those uh, who, who have died and are in purgatory, the church doesn't have... Uh, strictly speaking, an authority, uh, but uh, can, uh, can ask God uh, by way of, of suffrage to, to apply these merits to, to those people who are, who are in purgatory, or to particular people who are in purgatory. So you can, can gain indulgences for yourselves, you can gain them, uh, or you can ask to have them applied to the, to the dead, but not uh, to another person who's living. They, because other people who are living have the ability to, to, uh, to do the actions to gain the indulgences for themselves, and so uh, there isn't the possibility of, of getting an indulgence for them. Before, there was, uh, there was a more complicated distinction of indulgences. They were, they were measured in, in days or, or years or, or so on, and those days or, or years or, or other periods uh, were periods of, of canonical penance. So in in, in ancient times, the, when the church, uh, when the, the sacrament of penance was, was celebrated, uh, the, the sins would be confessed and then a penance would be assigned. And the penance for, for grave sins would usually last some years. So years of, of, of fasting uh, or uh, other, other penances as well. And the, the person who was in this, this condition of penance wouldn't, wasn't able to participate fully in the Mass. And then at the, at the end of their, their years of penance, uh, then uh, no, canonic, called canonical penance, because it was established by canon law, at, at the end of their, their years of penance, then they would be, be reconciled to the, uh, to the church and could, could then once again participate uh, fully in the Mass, receiving, the, receiving communion. Um, but as time went on, that system sort of broke down, because in the early centuries people were very fervent, and, and so if they committed a, a sin, they would, would do their, their years of penance uh, and uh, you know, be, be reintegrated. Um, but in, in the, the Middle Ages, the, 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 the European peoples who were, who were converted um, and not always very well instructed, uh, weren't quite as convinced about this thing. And so they would, they would put off confessing until the end of their life. So, you know, I'll, uh, I'll wait until the, the end of my life. When, when, I'm, when I'm very ill, then I'll, then I'll confess and I'll get my canonical penance. And they'll assign me the years to do. 
uh, but then, then I die, I get out of it. So, so they give me, when, when, I'm, when I'm dying, they'll give me absolution, uh, off I go well, to purgatory, really, not having done enough penance on, on earth. But it's sort of uh, our, our general tendency to seek a, a comfortable life here on earth and not worry too much about what's coming afterwards. Uh, and so the church changed the way that the, the sacrament and penance worked. Uh, that instead of, of confessing and then getting years of penance, uh, they would, and, and then after the years of penance getting absolution, uh, they sort of reordered things. They had the, the liberty to, to, to make at least these, these minor changes to the, the sacrament of penance. So, so now you, get, uh, you confess your sins and you get the, the absolution right away and you get a penance which is a light penance. But you know, the, the light penance that you get is, is sort of a, a start, but, it's, but if in the past it took years of penance to, to, uh, to cancel these sins, it's doing, you know, I don't know, saying three Hail Marys or, or, uh, or a rosary uh, is, is probably, is almost certainly not getting rid of everything and, and that would probably explain why there are so many people in purgatory. Uh, and so the, when, when the indulgences were measured in, in days or, or years or, or other periods, that was, was days or years of, of, of canonical penance. So someone who got, uh, who, who was, was uh, sentenced, if that's the right word for it, uh, to do you know, five years of, of, of penance for a sin they'd committed. Uh, no, if they got uh, an indulgence of, of, of two years, then they only had to do three years of their penance instead of five years. Um, and you know, if they did something that was a, a plenary indulgence that, that canceled everything, well, that, you know, then uh, that, that took care of their entire penance. Uh, and so they could uh, you know, receive uh, absolution and, and go back to Mass straight away. Uh, so, uh, and so in the... But, you know, now people don't really, but it, as, as years went on and, and you know, after the Middle Ages, there was no longer this system of, of canonical penance. People forgot what, uh, what uh, 500 days indulgence meant. Uh, and they thought it was 500 days off of purgatory. Uh, but you know, we don't, that's, purgatory is, uh, purgatory is a bit different from here because time, well, not to get too philosophical, but, but time is, is connected with, uh, with having a, a body, with material change. And, and so without a, a body in purgatory, time isn't quite like it is here. Uh, that is, there isn't time like there is here. There's a, there's a duration, but it's not exactly the time that we know. Um, so there are stories in the, 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 of you know, a Franciscan who died uh, you know, and someone had promised to uh, to say mass for him, or to, uh, and uh, so he so he dies, and, and after after three days he, he comes back and, and appears and, and says, no, why haven't you been saying mass for me? I've been in purgatory for hundreds of years. Well, it seemed like hundreds of years to him, but it was really only three days. Um, so, yeah, so there there are, anyway so. Uh, Paul VI decided to, to simplify the system of indulgences and also to eliminate certain categories of indulgences that were more targets for, for criticism against the church. Uh, and so with, with him, there's, there's only two kinds of indulgences. There's the plenary indulgence and the partial indulgence. So if it's not plenary, if it's plenary, it, it covers everything. If it's not, it, it's a partial indulgence. And all partial indulgences are, are now uh, the same. So the, the partial indulgence is giving you double credit, basically. Whatever you merit before God for the, for the, the prayer you've said or for the penance you've done, uh, if there's a, a partial indulgence attached, the church adds as much again as, as you did. And this is to encourage you to, to not try to say, you know, Lots of prayers. You know, be, before, if there was an, a prayer that, that had 500 days indulgence to it, somebody might say it you know, fast 20 times in order to get uh, 10,000 days indulgence out of it. Uh, but they weren't praying very well. So the, the new system is trying to encourage people to pray better, to be more fervent in their prayers, because the, the better you pray, uh, the, the better you make, the more fervently you make a visit to a, to a church or so on, uh, the more 
uh, the church gives you in, in addition. Uh, so then, you know, besides the, the partial, in, so that's the, the partial indulgence. The plenary indulgence obviously you know, cancels everything. And for a plenary indulgence, you have to do uh, the work to which the indulgence is attached. So that's uh, you know, just the same as for a partial indulgence. And then you also have to, to fulfill these, these three uh, additional con conditions. Uh, sacramental confession, uh, Eucharistic communion, and prayer for the intentions of the Holy Father. So the, you know, the, so the sacramental confession can be, if you're in a state of grace, it can be up to, to, uh, to three weeks before you, you, uh, you carry out the indulgence act. Uh, the communion, usually you can do within a few days. And one, one confession and one communion can, can be, uh, are, are sufficient for multiple indulgences. But these days, we tend to receive communion frequently. So. Uh, and then the, the prayer for the Holy Father, uh, it's sufficient to say in Our Father and to Hail Mary. Uh, and then, then comes the, uh, the tricky condition. This is the one why, why, people don't, why not many people get plenary indulgences. So you also have to be detached from, well, yeah, it's further required that all attachment to sin, even venial sin, be absent. So what's attachment to sin? Attachment to sin is not being repentant of it. Right, so if you're repentant of a sin, then you don't want to commit it anymore. Uh, and maybe through weakness you'll fall into that sin again, but you, your, your intention is to, to give it up forever, even though maybe you know that realistically uh, you're, you're weak and, uh, and probably temptation it might, might be even, uh, even more than a few days before you, you fall into the, the same sin again, especially if we're talking about venial sins. Uh, but if you, you are truly repentant from it, you're sorry that you did it in the past and you don't want to do it in the future, uh, then you are not attached to that sin. On the other hand, if you think that there's no way to get through life without that sin, like, I don't know, we have to tell some lies to get through life. Otherwise, life is too hard. Uh, it, there's no way that I can avoid being, being embarrassed or getting other people into trouble unless I tell some lies in my life. So, yeah, I confess that I, I told some lies, but I'm not really going to give them up in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's attachment to sin. <laughs> and so if you try for a plenary indulgence and, and you, you don't get it because you don't fulfill all the conditions, then you get a, a partial indulgence for that action. And there are, there are plenary indulgences that can be obtained. And so no, the, the idea here is that, no, yeah, the church is, is canceling your entire debt, uh, but to do it, you have to be completely repentant. So the church is, is in this way, encouraging you to, to full repentance for your sins. Now, if you're, you're repentant uh, of your, your grave sins, then that's enough to receive absolution but you might be left still with the guilt of other sins of which you're, venial sins of which you're not repentant. So the church is trying to get you fully clean and holy like God wants you to be holy. Um, let's see, so plenary indulgences that you can obtain any day are for the, the rosary, piously recited in a, in a church or, or a public oratory or in a, in a family group or in really in any gathering of the faithful for an honest purpose. Uh, also, the, the way of the cross, uh, properly made. Uh, reading scripture devoutly for half an hour, or uh, visiting and adoring the Blessed Sacrament for half an hour. Uh, no. I, I decided to talk about this uh, today because there's no, uh, any, we're going to, in our, in our church, visit a number of, of basilicas. And so any time that you, you visit a, a basilica, there's, there's a, a plenary indulgence for that. You have to say, uh, the, to, to make a, a visit, you have to go into the church and say uh, the creed and, and the Our Father, any formula of the creed. If you remember the, the Apostles' Creed that we say in the Rosary, that's fine. Or you can do the, the Nicene Creed that we say at Mass, uh, or any other approved formula of the creed, although probably the, the other formulas are, are a little more obscure. Uh, and then uh, you have to, you know, obviously, for the plenary indulgence, the other conditions that I, I mentioned, confession, communion, prayer for the Holy Father, and uh, detachment from all sin. Uh, 
then you know, they were going to the uh, to the Portsioncula, the, the chapel of our, our Our Lady of the Angels, the little church of Our Lady of the Angels, in, uh, outside of Assisi. There, uh, there was a, a plenary indulgence, and so a, any basilica you can can choose, uh, or any any minor basilica, and, and all the more major basilicas you can choose. Uh, any of year of the any day of the year on which you, you happen to visit uh, to receive the, the the plenary indulgence for that visit. Um, so there are, are lots of opportunities almost every day or, or many days during this this pilgrimage to obtain a plenary indulgence. Okay, so there's also the the last plenary indulgence. The church gives you one last chance to the to the faithful in danger of death who cannot be assisted by a priest so as to bring them the sacraments and impart the apostolic blessing with its, with its plenary indulgence. Holy Mother Church nevertheless grants a plenary indulgence to be acquired at the point of death, provided that they are properly disposed and have been in the, in the habit of reciting some prayers during their lifetime. And so the, the use of a, a crucifix or a cross to gain this indulgence is praiseworthy, but it's not strictly acquired. So the church gives you a, a last chance on your way out to, to obtain a plenary indulgence. Okay, so I'm going to, to stop there and, and then we have a, a few minutes for questions if you have some questions. You can, you can ask your question now, yes. Uh, if, if an atheist died of a tragic murder, where would his soul go? And um, will he get uh, God's mercy? Or at any way to save his soul? Like Gregorian Mass, can we save that person's soul? Uh, well, Gregorian Masses get people out of purgatory if they're in purgatory. Uh, or at least they're, they're a highly effective way of getting people out of purgatory if they're in purgatory. Uh, it's not a 100% guaranteed because uh, we're always asking something of God and he may decide that it's more, more just to, to help someone else with those Masses. Uh, or, or may decide that it's, it's just to, to purify the person a lot, but leave, them in, leave that person in purgatory. Uh, so if, if the, the person is in purgatory, then the Gregorian masses or, or other suffrages, other things that we can offer for them, can get them out of purgatory. If he's in hell, then, then nothing will get him out of hell. If he's in heaven, then he doesn't need our help. Uh, so you know, where the, the atheist goes, uh, we, we don't know. Um, we you know, try not to be an atheist, but because uh, then you're, you're seriously putting your salvation in doubt. There, there's no salvation without faith. But a person who seems to be an atheist might really have faith because the God that they, they say doesn't exist isn't the, the God that, that really exists. That is to say that a atheists, people who call themselves atheists, often have an idea of God that doesn't correspond to reality. You know, they might, maybe they, they have sort of a, a childish idea of God as a, uh, an old man with a, a beard that's up in the sky. And no, there isn't an old man up in the, with a beard up in the sky who's God. So you know, what they're de denying isn't, isn't the real God. And they might, by believing in some, I don't know, force or, or principle, really believe in God. Um, so, you know. If, if that person never had a chance to... Uh, uh, to hear God's word, like, grow up from a communist country. Yeah, well, I know those to whom less is given, God, judge, God judges them uh, more mercifully. So it, it, they, they, they have to have faith and they, and they have to have charity when they die in order to, to go to, to, to heaven or, or to purgatory. Uh, whether they, uh, obviously, that's going to be more difficult to get if there's no one around them to explain anything about God and the things that they're told about God are, are not true, uh, like he doesn't exist. Uh, basically, we entrust these people to, to God's mercy. We don't really know. If the, no, it, it seems reasonable that if someone is, is faithful, it tries to do, do, the, do good as they, know, as they know it, tries to follow the, the inspirations that God may send them, which he can send them even if there's no one in their, in their country to tell them anything about God, uh, then you know, God could reward that person with, with, the, his, with, the, the, uh, with faith and with, with love. Uh, 
so that they, they're in grace and, and when they die, go to heaven. Um, but we can't really know in individual cases whether a, a particular person uh, had in their, in their heart uh, the faith in God who with their, their words they denied. Uh, I, you know, I, would, I would imagine that the chances are not good, but you know, we hope and, and pray that God uh, gave them that grace to, uh, to know him before they died. Uh, so I guess the, the, really the only thing that we can do for these people, if, we, if there's someone in particular that you're thinking of that you want to help, would be to, to pray now that God give that person the necessary graces before they died. So you know, prayer works by, by merit, and God is in eternity. So we can pray now for something that, that needed to, to happen in the past. Uh, so long as we don't know it didn't happen. Uh, if we know it didn't happen, then it's, it's clearly useless to, to ask God to do it because he can't change what, what happened. Um, but he might, in virtue of the prayers that we say now, give the grace of salvation to someone who died in the past. Where did the concept of indulgences then from? Did it come from scripture? Did our church... Well, it, uh, well, our, our church gradually realized that this was possible. Oh, sorry, yeah, the, I have to repeat your question because there's, you don't have a microphone. Uh, so you asked where the, uh, the concept of indulgences uh, came from uh, and, and whether the, the church made it up or, or it was in scripture. No, uh, and this is basically the concept of, of development of doctrine that uh, blessed John Henry Newman wrote a, a whole book about. So uh, what, what God revealed to us is, is, uh, is complex. Uh, it's, there's, there's a lot there, and uh, you don't realize everything that's there when you first hear about it. You, know, you, you can't, if you read the Bible, there are many things in it that are, that are implicit that, that aren't obvious, but then that uh, you, know, you realize, or people gradually realize thinking about it century after century, and also being, being enlightened by God and, and living holy lives. Uh, so uh, if we read the, the, the gospel, we read about uh, our, the things that our Lord uh, suffered, and uh, if we think about it, we say, well, he didn't have any sins to, to expiate. You know, so we can see in, uh, in, in the Old Testament, like in that, that uh, bit from Isaiah, that something remains to, to, to expiate even if sin is forgiven, so that there's a need to do penance. But Christ was doing penance, and so he must have been meriting for something, but he wasn't meriting for himself. Well, he had to have been meriting for us then. Uh, so if he was meriting for us, how does that work? Well, you know, the, the church knew that it had, had this idea even from the in the very early centuries, we find the, the, the early Christians doing this, uh, at least in the, in the fourth century, it's, it's clear that uh, people have a, a sense of, of some kind of state of, of purification after, after death. Uh, and we also find in the, in the book of Maccabees uh, the, that uh, there's a, a collection made to offer a sacrifice for people who have died so that their, their sins can be expiated. But you know, when judgment comes right after death, so that can't be about the, the guilt. It can't be about them getting out of hell. But it, so it has to have to do with this need to do penance. There must be some kind of purification that happens after this life. And you know, this kind of, of purification that happens after this life, well, uh, saying masses can help with that. The, the church must be, there must be a reason why the church keeps saying masses for people, but doesn't say masses for martyrs because it knows that the martyrs were completely purified by their death. But for other people, it offers the sacrifice of the mass for them. And so, you know, it's sort of drawing out the implications of the things, of the, the lived experience of the church and, and the implications of the scriptures. The church comes gradually to the realization that there's a, a treasury of merits, that there are all these merits that uh, Christ did this, but it's, not, it's obviously not automatically happening for everyone, or else there wouldn't be any need to say, say masses for people who have died. So it must be something that we have to do to, to apply those merits to people. Well, who has the authority to do this? Well, the church is the minister of redemption. 
So if the church is the minister of redemption, then the church would have the authority to establish something that if you do it, then we'll, we'll use some of the, the treasure of merits to help a person who has died or to help a person who, who is still alive to cancel some of the penance that they're supposed to do. Uh, and, and so originally these, these indulgences uh, were for uh, uh, things like making a pilgrimage to the Holy Land or making a pilgrimage to Rome. Uh, and then along came St. Francis and he, he said, I want an indulgence for my, for my church. And he said, well, and the Pope said to him, well, how many, how, many, uh, how many years of indulgence do you want? And he said, you know, in, in, in Italian, years is, is, is ani. And he said, uh, I don't want ani, I don't want years, I want anime, I want souls. <laughs> I want you to, to deliver, I want a, a complete indulgence for anyone who enters this chapel. Because I asked, our, our, Lord, our Lord appeared to me and, and I asked him and he said that, that he would give me that if I, I got it confirmed by, by the Pope. So then St. Francis went to the Pope to get this confirmation. The Cardinal said, you can't do this. It's, it's a tiny little church. It's, it's not like going to Rome or the Holy Land. But no, it, the, the Pope was convinced of St. Francis's holiness, so he gave him that, and that was the, the Portiuncula indulgence, uh, the, church, the indulgence for the, the Church of Our Lady of the Angels. And then gradually, the Church continued to, uh, to expand these indulgences, and it found that they were uh, also a, a useful way of encouraging uh, all kinds of, of acts of, of piety, uh, you know, assisting at, at Mass at a particular altar, uh, or uh, or making a pilgrimage to a particular place, or saying certain prayers, and by giving different levels of indulgence to different prayers, they could encourage one prayer more than another. Um, you know, a, a year of indulgence for this prayer, you know, 300 days for that prayer, um, or, or something like, you know, there were prayers that if you said them every day, there was a partial indulgence, but if you did it every day for a month, there was a, a plenary indulgence. Uh, so it was a way of encouraging uh, the faithful to, to pray more, uh, to, to, to exercise their faith more. But uh, fundamentally, it, it has to do with this idea of development of doctrine. It's things that, that you realize gradually, uh, that you, you don't really see everything that they, the ideas uh, of Christianity imply. You know, and even today, if you tried to, to, to make a list of of, of propositions, of truths that, that Christianity uh, believes, you, you'd never come up with a complete list. Because there would always be other things that are sort of implied or, or, or so forth. Uh, and this is not only that, you know, Saint, uh, well, future Saint, uh, now blessed, uh, John Henry Newman uh, you know, points out that this is really the case with, with any kind of, uh, of complex idea or you know, like you know, take democracy for example. You know, democracy sort of means that people can vote, but a democracy also implies all sorts of other things that aren't just the fact that you can vote. It implies a particular status of the citizens in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the society uh, because you know, they vote and it implies certain things about their relation to the people who represent them. And not all of that is, is obvious, but it's things that you, you sort of realize and, and work out century after century and then codify in, in law. But there are other things about democracy that aren't codified, but that, that are people's expectations. And when they, so they, something happens and they say that's undemocratic because it doesn't fit with their understanding of what democracy is. So you know, Christianity being another kind of complex idea is like that, that there are things that aren't explicit in, in scripture. Uh, and it's not as though the church made them up, but the church gradually came to that realization. Father, what is lacking in us that prevents us from making true contrition? You know, like the example you gave of the lady, because of that monk, and had real true contrition, and died and their soul is taken to heaven. But what's lacking in us that we can never really have true contrition for our sins? Well, it's a grace. I'm sorry, why, what is lacking that we can never have true contrition for our sins? So I told the story about the lady who uh, 
uh, told the story about the, about the lady who was, when the, the monk came and, and talked to her and, and you know, with complete contrition, she immediately wanted to, to abandon uh, everything and, and uh, save her soul and, uh, and, and get to heaven. Uh, so it, it's a grace, uh, and because it's a grace, it's not something that we can, can merit, but it's something that we should pray for. So you know, one good step is, is to pray for, for greater con contrition. Uh, that's sort of a, a good piece of advice for, uh, uh, for when you confess, that something that's often sort of left out of the instructions that, that people receive. Uh, you know, you're told that you should examine your conscience, but uh, so you should try to put yourself before God, think of the, the commandments or think of, of virtues, think of the, the beatitudes or something that gives you a, a standard to measure your life against. Uh, and then uh, you know, come up with a, a list of the, the ways that you've, you've uh, gone against the, the model of, of Christianity, that, uh, the model of what a Christian is that, that uh, Christ and the church give us. Uh, and then once you have your list, well, then, then off you go to confess. Well, no, there's another thing that you, you ought to do first, and you ought to, to pray for contrition, because the more contrite you are from your, for your sins, the, the more you, you detest your sins and see them as a, as a real evil, as indeed the, the greatest of evils, uh, the, more you, you, the more grace you will receive from confessing, and, and the more uh, that grace will, will purify your soul. And, and make you holier. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean that's so. It's it's a grace to pray for. That's that's one point. Now, uh, another point is uh, no, we need to to convince ourselves of the evil of sin. Uh, we need to convince ourselves that it really is the worst thing uh, <laughs> possible to commit a sin. Uh, so, uh, blessed. Uh, John Henry Newman, to use him again as an example, uh, wrote that he would rather let a war start than, than say a lie to stop it. He was, because he was really convinced that every physical evil, even the physical evil that's a war, that lots of people are going to die, is not as bad as sin is. Which is what faith tells us, but it, I don't know how many of us really believe that. Lots of people would say, well, why don't you just tell the lie? <laughs> What's your hang-up? Well, he was really convinced that the worst thing that you can possibly do is offend God. Because you know, it's only sin that sends people to hell. It's only sin that sends people to purgatory. Any other evil that happens in this world is just a temporary problem. Everything will be sorted out at the resurrection. And we'll all be better than ever. Um, so, you know, we need to convince ourselves of the evil of sin, and, and meditation is the, the, the tool for this. Not Buddhist meditation of trying to empty your mind, but Christian meditation of thinking about the truths of faith, trying to, to apply, apply them to your life and to grow in love for God. Okay, now I'll take another question. Yes. Uh, if, uh, this term of the purgatory on earth, does that mean those, play, those people, they are, suffer a lot when they live, and when, after they die, they, are, they shorten their, the time in the purgatory? Uh, well, those people suffer a lot so when you're, they're living. Uh, are you talking specifically about, so you're asking about uh, people who, who suffer their, their purgatory on earth and what this means. So yeah. you're talking specifically about the case of St. Catherine of Genoa that I was talking about, or just in general about... Well, in general, those people, there's some people, they really suffer a lot. Right. And that means they're doing the, uh, doing the, the purgatory duty on earth. Well, yeah. So people who suffer, so you're asking in general about people who suffer a lot on this earth and, and whether that means they're, they're doing their purgatory here. Uh, it, it, when people suffer a lot, it means God is giving them an opportunity to do their purgatory here, but it depends how they react to their suffering. So you can react to your suffering by, by accepting it as, as God's will, by accepting it as, as something that uh, you probably deserve for your sins, because sins deserve the punishment of, of hell, or, or for venial sins, at least purgatory, 
And so anything that we suffer on this earth is, is a lot less than what we deserve, uh, even if it seems really horrible. Uh, and so if you accept for the, for the love of God that what you're suffering, then it will be uh, effective in, in doing as penance for your sins and, and therefore uh, shortening your purgatory. Uh, unfortunately, people who, who suffer uh, tend instead to rebel against the suffering. Uh, and sometimes they, they start uh, cursing God or, or you know, blaming God for making them suffer. Uh, and if they're doing that, then they aren't shortening their purgatory. What about the word from a dying person on the end to say, I accept God, you can take me now as, a, as an act of my penance. Is, is that still an act of penance? Uh, so you're asking if, if dying itself can be an act of penance. And so, uh, yes, it certainly can. That's, uh, no. That's something that... Uh, that the old uh, Roman uh, catechism, the Catechism of Trent, talked about. That uh, also, you know, we see a number of saints who talk about it. Uh, so, yes, it's the you know, basically giving up one's life, recognizing that as something that's coming from God, and, and offering that. Uh, Saint uh, Alphonsus Liguori, in, in particular, uh, encourages us to to offer in, in advance whatever death uh, God may may give us. Uh, because when we die, we might not have the chance. Uh, you know, we might be unconscious or, or it might come upon us so suddenly that we don't recognize it. So we can offer that in, in advance and, and therefore that can have, have a, a value for, for freeing us uh, from purgatory. The, the case of the martyrs is of course the, the strongest case where they with their, their death, uh, also a death for Christ, uh, cancel everything and therefore go directly to heaven. I just to ask you to clarify something. I think you said to be truly spiritual and holy and to separate yourself from um, the fellowship of the world. Yes. Um, but you said that you can separate yourself from things around you and creatures. I think you mean the words creatures. Well, what do you mean by creatures? Yeah, so uh, you're asking, the, no, I, I was talking about for holiness, uh, you have to be detached from, from creatures. Uh, so what's a creature? Everything that is not God is a creature. So you can ask you this, how does matrimony come into that, sacrament matrimony? Yes. you actually explicitly convincing yourself to one person. Right. Okay, so how does matrimony fit into this? So no, not being attached to creatures is not the same as not loving creatures. Being attached to a creature is loving the creature more than God. And when we love someone or something more than God, then uh, we're, we're ready to commit sins for that in order to not lose whatever benefit we feel we're getting from the creature, offending God rather than, than offending the creature or rather than losing the creature. Um, so God made matrimony a, a sacrament. He sanctified it in order to, to specifically give this grace to uh, to to not be, to, to overcome the, the, the attachment that we would tend to have toward creatures. You know? So when God made us in the beginning, before original sin, uh, we, didn't, we weren't, didn't have any inclination to love, love creatures more than, than God. Uh, but after original sin, it, uh, we, we tend to, to stop at the creature and not think about God who created it, not think about these perfections, the perfections that we see in the creature being a participation in God and therefore rising from loving the, 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 the creature to loving God even more because in him there, there are even more the perfections that we love in the creature. Uh, and so, you know, Matt, Matt Christian marriage uh, especially tries to do Know, spiritualizes the, the relationship between the, the spouses that yes they're supposed to be faithful uh, to one another for life but like Christ is faithful to the church and Christ is not leading the church away from away from God nor is the, the church you know, turning uh, away from God but uh, in order to, to when it goes to Christ uh, and so 
yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, so there's, in marriage, there's a, a risk of attachment to the creatures because there's obviously a, a great love, or there should be a great love between husband and, and wife, but uh, matrimony is giving, is offering graces in order to, to overcome that and love uh, the loved one's spouse uh, for God's sake, and therefore uh, love one's spouse not more than God or instead of God. But yeah, it can be the it can be easier to not be married. That's that's the idea of the the vow of chastity. Um, and it's easier in terms of attachment. Obviously, it's, it's superhuman in terms of what it's asking. So it's. <laughs> well, you also have to get on. You have to get on with your your compatriots in the in the you know your order, don't you? As well. So there is that relationship as well. Yeah, well, I certainly relation. Well, it's certainly relation. You were talking about relationships with other people. Uh, yes, everyone has to deal with relationships with other people, unless it's a, a hermit living in the middle of the desert, and he would, even he has to love his neighbor, even though his neighbor isn't near him. All right, now it is, is time to, to conclude this, this with a, a prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Our Lady of Loreto, in the name of the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit.